last week, well, two weeks ago, we started looking at the life of Moses and what lessons we could learn from his example, his mistakes, and how God moved in his life and how he, he was used by him. We will continue next week looking into life of the completion of the life of Moses. But today, like I said last week, I wanted to focus on one thing. As you remember, we looked at the ten plagues, the ten curses that God brought on Egypt. The ten false gods of Egypt that were punished and also God showed himself strong and to be the one true God in front of the Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. But the last curse is the one that I wanted to hone in on because what that last curse catapulted led into Jesus' time and it comes into our day today. The last curse was the last plague, if you want to call it, was the plague of the firstborn. Exodus chapter 12 begins with, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this will be a month This month is to be for you the first month, first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with one of their nearest neighbors having taken into the account of the number of people. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed according to each household. The animals you choose must be a year old male without defect. You may take from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood, put it on the sides and the top of the door frames of their homes where they live. The same night they are to eat the meat roasted over fire, along with bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with the head, legs, and the internal organs. Do not leave any of it until the morning. If some is left till the morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak, tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. With this, Israelites followed exactly these orders. And they did exactly what the Lord said. What happened in return is that very night, that plague, that curse, that punishment that came from the Lord killed every single firstborn in Egypt. From Pharaoh's firstborn to the person in the dungeon to all the animals. And in the middle of the night, Pharaoh called Aaron and Moses And he said, finally, go. 
He didn't have to go through this punishment. People of Egypt did not have to go through this. But because the hardness of his heart, because of his stubbornness, because of his pride, this calamity came to him and to his people. Now, why did I want to hone into this point? What is the big, big issue with this? I'm hearing a ring. That's why I'm playing. Are you guys hearing a ring too? Oh, good. John is hearing it. Sonia Queer is not. Okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, there are so many parallels in Passover. There are so many parallels to Jesus in the picture of Passover. And Passover is still celebrated today in Jewish families. And it's celebrated exactly the way the Lord had told them. Because he's going to instruct them and tell them to continue this from generation to generation. Teach your children. And when they ask why, explain to them what's happening. Now this tradition came 1,350 years all the way to Jesus in Jerusalem. After that, it continues in our churches what Jesus instituted in that Last Supper, as it's called. So that's why I wanted us to take a look at this first Passover, which affects us today here. And I wanted us to look at the parallels to Jesus and the Passover. You're going to say, what does Jesus have to do with Passover? One is different than the other. It is actually not. Because that was God's way of teaching Israelites, teaching all the people and teaching us that Jesus is the Savior. He started all the way back then. You see, by the time the tenth plague was over, Israelites had been through hell. So did the Egyptians. But in the midst of all this, God is talking about a tradition, a festival, a holiday. Lord, what are you doing? Let's just get out of here with our lives intact. He's talking about a tradition, a festival. This is how we are going to celebrate it. He's, in essence, instituting them from the family of Jacob into the nation of Israel. The family is becoming a nation. And with that, God is giving them a new calendar. He is saying that this month of Nisan is going to be your first month. And then you're going to keep track of things from starting this month. That's going to be the first month of the year for them. So he's giving them a new beginning, new way of things. And along with that, he's giving them something to look forward to. Something to learn from. And a big lesson if they're paying attention to it. If we're paying attention to it. What was the lesson? A lamb had to be sacrificed for them to live. As you know the story, as I just partially read it, they had to sacrifice a certain kind of a lamb. And they had to do certain things. But the most important thing was the blood of that lamb had to be on the top and sides of their doorposts. Some said if you connect those dots, it makes the sign of the cross. I thought. But it was the blood that saved them. It was the blood of the lamb. The presence of the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Who's the lamb 
in the Bible? Jesus. I'm going to show you the connections of Passover and Jesus. There are ten major connections. Parallels, if you want to call it. First one is God told them to, on the first day of the month, get the lambs and for four days watch over it. The lamb had to be chosen and brought into the house four days before Passover. Four days before his death on the cross, Jesus came into Jerusalem in a monkey, uh, on a donkey. And the reason for those four days were they had to examine the lamb. And when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he was teaching. He was talking with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were listening to him. They were examining him. And the sacrifice had to be without blemish. The lamb had to be without blemish, without cuts, without deformities, without bruises. Jesus was without sin. He was without blemish. And the lamb had to be one year old, prime of his life. Jesus was in the prime of his life when he was sacrificed, when he was 33 years old. Lamb had to be a male. Jesus came to earth as a man. Everyone, every house and each family had to have their own lamb. Everyone had to have one lamb. Even if they had, if they had to share it, but everybody had to have that blood for themselves. Everyone has to open their own heart to what Jesus has done and personally accept them as their Lord and Savior. Fourteenth day is also important. The Passover lamb was slain on the eve of Passover. On the afternoon of the fourteenth day of Nisan, which is the first month of the Jewish calendar, Jesus is the lamb that was sacrificed at the same time with the lambs before being killed on the 14th day of the first month of the ninth hour. As they were slaughtering the Passover lambs, as they were killing them, Jesus was dying on the cross. Exact same time. The, the parallels are impossible to miss to a person who is paying attention. This is, John, uh, this is God proclaiming 1,300 years ago, this is what's going to happen. Pay attention to it. Listen to it. Look for it. But those who were looking and paying attention were saved. Those who did not care, they wanted to hold on to their traditions, their understandings, rather than listening to God, they were lost. The Israelites weren't allowed to break the bones of the lamb. Not during cooking, not even during eating. Jesus' bones did not get broken during the torture and the mockery he endured or during crucifixion. They broke the leg bones of the two thieves next to him. But they did not touch Jesus, do you remember? No leftovers was also important. God made sure to make that point very clear. The lamb had to be consumed entirely on the eve of Passover. Nothing was to remain overnight. Jesus was taken off the cross the same evening of his crucifixion, although this wasn't customary. Did you know that they would leave 
all the people that were crucified on the cross as an example for a few days until they it started decomposing. Just so that everybody would look and say, take a lesson. Don't go against the Roman Empire. This is what will happen to you. But in Jesus' case, they took him down immediately that night. No leftovers. He was not left out there. And the blood. The Israelites had to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on their doorpost as a sign to God. And every single Christian must have the blood of Jesus in their heart. The door of their heart. It needs to be here. If not, when we stand before him, the angel of death will come and separate us from him. This is what we call hell. You see, God was also teaching that there is no forgiveness with, without blood. And sin has a consequence. We know that none of us are perfect to the standard of God. We know that we are all sinful. It is only his sinless, without blemish blood that can save our sinful bodies. Just like it was that innocent lamb that had to die through the lamb's blood, the people in that house were saved. Through Jesus' blood, we are saved. There is no forgiveness without blood. There is no forgiveness without death. If we die without being forgiven, we, all we can do is pay for our own sins. And when we pay for our own sins, our punishment is eternal separation from God. That's the only way we can pay for our sins. We cannot pay for it and come back to God. It's not possible. We pay for it by being separated from God. That's hell. Hell is eternal. It's not temporary. It's not a prison sentence. It's eternal. So unless you believe in Jesus and follow him as your Lord and your Savior, you're surrendered to him, you're walking with him, your sins are not forgiven. Our Father is waiting for us. Our Lord is waiting for us. One of the commentaries was uh, mentioning this. He said, even the way Jesus was crucified on the cross, his arms were open. He was inviting you. You know, that made me think, if I want to call one of my children to give them a hug, or if, if I want single signal to them that come, what do I do? I open my arms. I say, come. That's what Jesus is doing. Saying, come. Why will you perish? Because of your pride. Because of your ignorance. Because of your arrogance. Because you want to do life according to your own understanding. There is an eternal consequence. There is eternal separation. There is eternal pain and suffering. Why? Go to him in humility. Go to him in love. He wants you to go to him. He's our loving heavenly father. Like I said about prayer, he's there waiting for us. Jesus said, which one of you, if your children is hungry, will give them a stone? Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. He has looked. From that day, before they left Egypt, God is planning the Passover meal of His Son and our communion table today. God is working on tomorrow already. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. 
Don't stress about it. Do what you, t you must do today. Whatever you have to do today. Whatever God is calling you to do today. Whatever he's telling you as a believer, as a follower of him, that you must do today. Without worrying and being anxious and being fearful about tomorrow. Do what you must do today. God is worrying about tomorrow, you see. And the part that affects us is in um, the Last Supper part of the Gospels. All three of them have it. All three of the synoptics have it. But let's look at Luke. Jesus sends his disciples to go into the city to find a house. And this is what he says. This is Luke chapter 22. Let's start from verse 13. They left and found things just as Jesus told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. Incidentally, do you know why it says reclined? Whenever I say, whenever you hear the word, phrase, Last Supper, almost all of us think about Michelangelo's painting. It has nothing to do with Last Supper at so many different levels. One, disciples and Jesus did not look like a bunch of women. I'm sorry. <laughs> they just didn't. They were not so effeminate. They weren't as pale. They didn't have long hairs like that. They didn't. And they definitely did not sit at one straight table facing the painter. <laughs> okay. It was a table shaped like a you, and they did not have chairs. They used to recline on one of their sides, like that. And you know the concept of divan, most of you guys know. It's basically like a big pillow on the ground. And then years later, they started elevating that. So that's where it comes from. The table is not this high from the ground. From the ground, the table is like this high. And they reclined against it. They kind of laid down on their sides. With one elbow, they propped themselves up. With the other hand, they just grabbed whatever they grabbed. That's the only way Apostle John can be in Jesus' bosom. So that's why it says, when they reclined at the table. All right, close parentheses. Let's continue. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the Passover meal, they were supposed to have bread, but the bread had to be without leaven, without yeast. In the Bible, yeast symbolizes sin. And even today, Jewish families that celebrate Passover, they have a tradition. They go through the house, they look for anything with yeast, and mother of the house takes a piece of bread that's yeasted, hides it in different places, and the kids are supposed to go find it. And they make a game out of it, and they take a feather and a pan and they just take out anything that has yeast in the house. They clean it and they take it. I don't know if they still do this, but they would take it to a synagogue and they would have one big bonfire and burn all this stuff. That's what they were instructed to do. What is the significance of yeast in the families? It was sin. Yeast symbolizes sin. 